welcome. Thank you so much to John for um, coming for this talk. And it's just uh, uh, very, very sad for us that we can't be there. Myself and Chris, we both got struck down with COVID. Um, well, but thank you to everybody who's helped us so much. John has been a, a colleague um, and joined in the commemoration for Lionel Sims, our late colleague, Lionel Sims, and he was part of the book that Fabio Silva and Liz Henty edited for Lionel. Um, and that was coming from John's PhD work on uh, the River of Milk, Road of Ashes, the Milky Way in astronomy and myth. And of course, the Milky Way has a lot of resonance for us in RAG. Well, it does for Denise Arnold, I know from her work, um, but it has for us in RAG because of its connections to Dark Moon. But I'm going to leave John to develop the whole thesis. Please Thank go you, on. Camilla. Thank you. Right. I was going to do like a, a little introductory spiel, but I, I tend to waffle on with those. And um, I then find that I've only got half an hour to do the slides. So I'm going to start straight on with the slides. Um, and say that I the idea behind the PhD actually came from I, I'm always loath to say this. Um, I had I had a dream with the image in the main image in the dream of the river of milk actually 33 years ago tonight. So I'm waiting to see what will happen tonight. Um, and um, uh, so I've been, it's been, yeah, 30, 33 years researching this topic, but it was only when I, I wrote the chapter um, for, for the book In Memory of Lionel that I really was made aware of, of you lot at RAG. And suddenly I realized that I thought, I mean, I thought I was going back a long way when I was interpreting medieval myth as possibly Neolithic, that's, you know, 5,000 years old. And for you, that's modern. Um, I've suddenly realized that there's, that this myth is a palimpsest, that there's a, a level underneath the myths that I I was researching that betray an earlier lunar culture, uh, the, the lunar key that Camilla talks about. Um, we will see that my my work has concentrated on the Milky Way, mainly within a, a, a kind of solar mindset. This is the, the Neolith late Neolithic and Bronze Age solarized version of an earlier myth. So the first half of the talk will be my research, um, what the Milky Way meant to um, our Neolithic ancestors, how it was um uh, portrayed within the ceremonial features the henges and, and the um tombs that i will mention how it was recorded in myth how this myth has changed and then we will look at we'll jump into um a, a, a coison myth of the milk of the production of the milky way which suddenly sheds a completely different light on the origin of the of the Neolithic myths that I was talking about. Uh, and um, it's suggestive that an old system has been changed. There's been a revolution um, to decrease the power of women and the moon. So having said, I wasn't gonna do an introduction. I've just talked for five minutes. Uh, I've, I've stopped myself short. So we'll start start with the story, the story that um, I dreamt about 33 years ago um, and left me on waking, wondering what what this myth meant. Um, it's an Irish myth. It was it's recorded in a few versions um, in the medieval period, and it deals with a hero called Cahullin. Cahullin um, he, it's a name that means the Hound of Cullen, and he is the Achilles of Irish myth. He is a young, 
precocious, violent, misogynistic. Um, is a pretty horrible person, really. But uh, Iron Age cultures, he was, he was the bee's knees. Um, if he was living today, he would already have an asbo or would be in prison for the just his violence and his attitude. But anyway, um, the story involves a the stealing of a woman. Um, the tale begins with the men of Ulster who are attacking an island off, off the coast of Ireland. And um, they are helped in this quest by a mysterious man in a grey cloak. Now, when it comes to dividing the spoils that they have um, achieved through their victory, um, they they divide them amongst themselves, but they ignore the man in the grey cloak who has helped them. Um, and it turns out that he's actually a god, and he takes great umbrage at the fact that he's been ignored. And so he steals um, the best of the treasure um, from the raid, um, one of which is um, Blornat, a woman, whose her name is, means flowers. Um, and he also steals a cauldron and three magical cows and the magical cows have this amazing property that they can produce the milk of 30 cows and he steals them um, away from this Cahulin who like Achilles in the Iliad has has kind of chosen this woman um, as as his possession um, but Kuroi the the man in grey um, steals it from him and goes to the west coast of Ireland, taking the woman and the cauldron and the three cows in tow. And Cahulin sets out across Ireland to rescue the woman, the cauldron and the cows from Kuroi. Now, Kuroi is a, a very strange character, and we'll see that he has um, a lot of supernatural characteristics, which put us in mind of... Um, a certain heavenly body, and that will be in the next slide. Is that Titian? This is um, Titian's, I think it's the Rape of Persephone, okay. yeah. yeah. And um, the story goes that Cahulin, the Achilles figure, pursues um, this couple to the west coast of Ireland, where he, um, Kuroi, the man in grey, has built a fortress on the Dingle Peninsula, which is, I think, County Kerry, right down the bottom, bottom west, southwest of Ireland. And he imprisons the woman, but um, she manages somehow to get in contact with Cahulin, and they come up with a plan how she might be rescued. Um, she says that her, her husband, the, the, the abductor, Ku Roy, um, he, he has a, a number of magical abilities. He, the fort that he lives in revolves at night like a mill wheel. So it's already putting us, you know, if you think of the night and the revolving, it's, this is a sky image, it's to do with the night sky. He also travels across the world from the east to the west. Um, he hardly ever comes back to his home, but sort of every now and again, he will be there on earth. Um, and at that time, Cahulin will be able to attack the fort and rescue the woman. And the sign she will give that her husband has, got, uh, has stopped his travels and has come into the fort, Kuroi is in the fort, is that there's a river that runs through the fort. Now, this fort has been built by pillar stones that have been brought together by all the men in Ireland. And a river runs through it. And when her husband is home, when Kuroi is home, she will be delousing his hair um, from the side of his bed, his, his bed is by the river in the fort for some strange unknown reason, but she will tie his hair to the bed and then she will pour water, milk into the river as a sign to Cahulin, who is waiting outside, that Kuroi is in the fort and he is trapped. So he's come from his travels, he's captured in the fort, 
and she will pour milk into the river. So the river of milk is a sign to Cahulin, who is outside, that he can come and attack the fort. So this is at the actual fort um, uh, sleeve mist. Um, but the, the, the tale is really about um, uh, standing stones, about stone circles. When we think of the, the fort that revolves at night, you can't find the entrance apparently after dark. Um, and it revolves like a mill wheel. And it is made up of every pillar stone standing or lying in Ireland. It's, a, it's an origin story about stone circles. So there was an agreement between Blornat and Cahulin, namely to pour the milk of Jochner's cows down the river in the direction of the Ulsterman so that the river might be white when she was bathing Kuroi. So it was done. It was poured down to them and the river then became thin glass, white flecked. She then began lousing his head in front of the stronghold. Thereupon Kuroi went inside and the woman bathed him and she bound his hair to the bedpost and rails and took his sword out of his scabbard and threw open the stronghold. He heard naught, however, until the old woman had filled the house and had fallen upon him. He rose up straight away against them and slew a hundred of them with kicks and blows to his fists. An attendant who was with, within rose up against them and slew 30 of them. Then it was that the clan did add, this is Kuroi's um, uh, clan, cast from them every pillar stone which was standing or lying in Ireland when they heard the shouting and came upon the slaughter around the fortress. When they were slaying one another by the fortress and Cahulian had cut off Kuroi said the fortress was aflame. So Cahulian, the young hero, kills the old, the old supernatural entity Kuroi and rescues the maiden. All well and good. What does it mean? Something which hadn't occurred to me until I was in touch with the, the, the people here at RAG was to interpret things looking at the moon. I'd always avoided the moon because as an archaeoastronomer, the moon is so complex. It's so much easier looking at where the sun is rising and setting because it's, it's pretty much like clockwork um, and yearly. The, the moon was too complicated for, for me. And so I, I, I avoided it like the plague. But recently I've had to start looking at, at lunar symbolism, um, which has been interesting. So looking at this myth, when I, looking at the figure of Kuroi, the man in gray, um, certain elements of his character suggest that he has lunar characteristics. His name means the hound of the plain or the wolf of the steppes. And the idea is that he's someone who travels, travels um, widely. Um, he's also a master of animals. He's associated with a figure in Celtic myth that we call the Bachlag, which is a, a, a kind of herdsman. It tends to be a, a one-eyed figure um, associated with wild animals and the hunt. Um, the one eye, obviously, um, is interesting in light of um, solar and, and lunar analogies, the, uh, the um, disk of the sun being the, the eye of divinity in many cultures. He's beheaded and beheads cyclically. There's a number of tales where he undergoes what is called the beheading test, and he tests a young hero by having the hero cut his head off. He then picks his head back and puts it on his shoulders and, it, and it's reborn. Um, this image of the of the beheading and the uh, severed head sort of flying through the air is something that we find in a lot of Indo-European myth um, associated with the sun and the moon. So the wounding of a god and the the head flying off is you know the image of the of the of the moon losing strength and then being reborn. This is something that is really apparent in the myth, but which I kind of chosen to ignore. Um, these other features, he journeys across the world from um, east to west. Um, he's the king of the upper world, and his fort revolves like a mill wheel, i.e. the place he lives, the sky, is forever turning. 
So it seems that, that this supernatural figure has a lunar origin. And then we look at other elements in the tale. Um, look what he steals from the men of Ulster and Cahullin. He steals the woman, the cows and the cauldron. Um, and the images I've put at the bottom, the, the silver cauldrons that we find in Celtic tradition. This is a Gundestrup cauldron from, from Denmark. They, they are very lunar in their aspect. And imagine filling this thing with milk. It's like the moon going from dark to full. And again, the cows, the magic cows um, who produce the milk, the the horns of the cows also suggest lunar symbolism. But I'm getting ahead of myself because, as I said, at the start, I I didn't consider lunar symbolism at all. Um, what I was really interested in was the image of the Milky Way. I mean, the Milky Castle Way. Ray. Sorry? Castle Ray. Castle Ray, yeah. Uh -huh. Looking seen there at night. strangely dying. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, Castle Rig, if, if you ever get the chance to go in the Lake District, it's probably the, the most amazingly set stone circle anywhere in the world. Um, Stonehenge is the most famous, but it's, it's the most boring landscape. I mean, it's, it's on a flat plane. It's not interesting at all. Um, don't quote me on that. I'll be kicked out of academia. Um, so yeah, what, what interested me was the was the Milky Way. This image of the of the woman pouring milk into the stream was one that occurred in this dream I had. And because I dreamt it, I thought, what does it mean? And it started me on this um, uh, this journey really to 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 seek out what the myth might might mean. It obviously has a connection to the turning of the sky and with um, a fortress or a site made of pillar stones. So my immediate intuition was the Milky Way is connected to stone circles um, in this myth. It does it does it um, uh, continue to um, uh, be linked in analysis? If I look at at um, the sites archaeologically and with the archaeoastronomy, can we see a link between these sites and the Milky Way? Now, the sites I was looking at, um, some of them were um, passage graves. These are great tombs with passages in them. Those, it's quite easy to see where those are aligned, whether there is an astronomical alignment. And the other sites I was looking at I was looking at were henges. Um, henge is a is a kind of misnomer. It's a modern word. Well, it's it's not a modern word, but it's a word that archaeologists have, have coined in recent times. Um, all henges are named after Stonehenge, and Stonehenge is a medieval word for the site, and it means the hanging stones, probably as in a gibbet as in a place to execute criminals. So it's the place of hanging, hanging stones. So that's what henge means. Um, so because that's one of the few that has a name, when archaeologists then found a wooden example close by, that became Woodhenge. And every other site, subsequently, a circular site, ceremonial site, um, has been named a henge, although it doesn't actually mean anything. And if you were to go back to the Bronze Age and Neolithic and ask people what a henge was, you know, it's a, they, they would have no idea. And archaeologists really have no idea what these sites were for. They were ritual sites. Ritual, as you probably know, is an archaeological term meaning we don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the henges are weird. They, they are ceremonial. They are, unlike other sites, they, they have this distinction that the, the bank is outside the ditch. 
Now this may, most sites you see are defensive sites. And on a defensive site, the ditch is always outside the bank because you don't want to give someone attacking you the high ground. You want them to fall down the ditch while you're standing on the top, filling them with arrows. So the hinge is the opposite of this. The hinge is not defending anything. If anything, it's defending the outside from what is in the inside. Is there something in here that they want to protect the rest of the world from? This is a place of, of danger, possibly. Something that needs isolating. This is like an airlock. You're keeping whatever is going on here away from the rest of society. Um, most hinges, that there are a number of um, different types of hinges. I'm not going to turn this into an archaeological lecture. But the majority have two entrances um, opposed to each other. You do get the odd example with four entrances, um, so-called super hinges like A3 in Wiltshire, which is just massive, which is really a hinge with two stone circles inside it. Well, it's actually got three stone, stone circles. Um, that's just to give you an idea of what, what, these, what these sites are like. So my question with, the, with my PhD was, what are the hinges looking at? Now, if you ask the man on the street, what are hinges oriented on? They will say, Mid, mid summer solstice something like that most people who go to stonehenge will go down to stonehenge at midsummer mainly because it's a lot nicer than going down at midwinter and you're more likely to see the sun although not that likely i mean this is the uk um but archaeologists now think that the majority of these sites which is thought to be aligned on midsummer are actually midwinter sites. And in a way, it makes more sense as an ancient culture to, to kind of celebrate that turn in the year from when everything's got dark, you want to suddenly, you want to think of spring. I mean, it's like this time of year, it's just, it's just boring and dark and wet. And you know, you need some chivying along to get through the winter months. You don't really want to be celebrating at midsummer because that's when everything goes pear shaped. That's when the nights start drawing in. You know, um, the the rituals of, of midwinter are more important. But how important were they in Neolithic times? This is very much a modern um, conception from the time of William Stukeley in the 1700s that these sites are all uh, aligned with the, with the solstices. Um, in my studies, I, I looked at the alignments of, I think it was 40, 40 henges. I'll show you a diagram of the ones I chose. Henges and um, other ritual structures like pasture graves. And I found that only a quarter of them have any relevance to um, uh, the mid winter sunrise and sunset. And only 12% have any relevance to the midsummer sunrise and sunset. So what are they looking at? What are the alignments on if there are indeed alignments? Oh, there doesn't have to be alignments. So um, one of the ideas put forward by my colleague Lionel, um, whose um, book here, The Solarizing of the Moon, um, which was brought out in his honor last October. Um, he was one of the, the first people to, to look at the alignments, the solar alignments, and to suggest that actually they were covering 
an earlier lunar pattern. They were um, an attempt by a culture to subvert the earlier mat uh, matrifocal um, rites. And I'm, I'm not really going to talk about what Lionel said because, I mean, you can go on YouTube and find so many of his lectures. Um, and they are very interesting and very entertaining and unfortunately very ignored by most of archaeology, um, which is a shame because I think that he is, he is spot on. Um, my own research, though, was not looking at the moon. It was, it was trying to avoid the sun and to look at other aspects of the site. What are they aligned on? And I started with um, Stonehenge, the most boring of all sites, which actually isn't a henge, because at Stonehenge, the um, bank is on the inside of the ditch. Um, so technically, according to archaeologists, Stonehenge isn't a henge. OK, go figure. Um, <laughs> But that's kind of irrelevant. It's just a very early site. It's a circular site. That's all we need to be interested in. What was interesting when I looked at Stonehenge is that um, north is up that way. So you have this main alignment across here towards the solstices. So this is, if you were standing in a circle looking out that way, you would see the midsummer sunrise. But if you were outside looking in, you would see the midsummer sunset. So that's the main axis, but there's also a entrance to the south. And also, which most archaeologists ignore, this strange little entrance to the south, southwest. And because everyone had ignored that, I thought, well, that's that's my kind of avenue into this. I will have a look at that, what's going on. Um and uh, I started to look at the the material culture that had been found in the in the ditches of Stonehenge. Um, this dates to about three thousand one hundred BC. The that's the first um, structure there. This is before any of the stones are in uh, in place. It's just that circular structure, and we find um, a number of objects being placed in the ditches. They tend to be um, these chalk balls, which no one really knows what they're for. I mean, they're a kind of fertility um, aspect has been suggested. Are, are they? Do they represent testicles? Um, other people have said, do they represent the sun? Um, very few people have said, is this white chalk ball representative of the moon? Um, go figure. Uh, the other thing you find are cattle bones, mainly cattle skulls. Um, sometimes each side of an entrance way, as if you're walking into the, the body of, of this cow. Uh, and they tend to be, where we can identify the sex, um, they tend to be female. So like the, the tale of Blornat that I mentioned at the start, where we had this um, the, the, the three cows which are stolen along with the with the lunar cauldron by this lunar figure and placed in a revolving temple made up of pillar stones, we have the cows present. Um, this is the next phase, which is only sort of a couple of hundred years later. And again, we have female aurochs um, skulls, actually, that's a um, boss um, primogenius, uh, the massive um, cow skulls, um, and then phase two A. Again, we have the, the skulls and the and the shall we call them lunar um, uh, lunar balls. So I was interested in this this south southwest entrance. Um, The trouble is, it was it was there in the first phase of Stonehenge, and then after a few hundred years, they close it up. And I thought, well, what's changed? 
And about the time they close it up, um, they, I don't know how you use it, it's just quite whited out. Um, they build a corridor within the south of the site, pointing through the southern entrance, at uh, more or less the same angle as the old entrance, but not quite. There's been a change. Um, so my idea was that something that they had aligned this entrance on something which had then changed, it had then moved, making that entrance redundant. Um, and the only thing it could be was stars. Stars shift slightly due to the phenomena of precession, normally about one degree every 72 years. Um, it's not going to be aligned on a mountain because mountains don't move that much. Um, so what I did was to build and uh, look at astronomy programs and try and see what these sites were looking at. What had moved? Um, what were the entrances aligned on? Why did they build this avenue within the circle? Um, which you can't really see on that. You can see it on my slide here, but for some reason, the, the contrast is a bit rubbish on that. Um, and the more I looked, the more I found that other sites had this strange orientation to just kind of east and west of, of north or south. And if you if you read the archaeological literature, um, I mean, basically, there's a load of circles here with lines coming off them. Okay, these are different sites, but they all have this this orientation. If you read the archaeological reports, and the archaeologists say that they are aligned roughly north and south. Um, I mean, the bottom ones are fine. These that's Thorn. These are um, some of the ones near Thornborough in Yorkshire. And you can see this slight, they're not north south, they're, they're skewed. I don't know what archaeologists think of the people of the past, but it's quite easy to work out where north is. If you if you want to put the effort in to make to align a structure to the north, it's pretty easy to do. You just need the stars or you need the sun. Um, so for them to say that the, these are roughly aligned north south is to is to think that our ancestors had no they just couldn't be asked you know yes. yeah it's like well it would do it's kind of north no one's going to notice it's not as if we've got drones people aren't going to be able to see it from the sky are they I, that just annoyed me you know uh, <laughs> obviously they were aligned on something they were, uh, um, and and this slide here we have the orientation, possible orientations, 360 degrees. And most of these sites that I looked at initially were falling outside any lunar or solar rising or setting positions. Because the sun and moon will never rise directly south or set directly north. It's all it's an east and west thing. So if anything, these were they, they were trying to avoid um, the solar and lunar rising and setting points, and they were also directly avoiding north and south. This wasn't to do with north and south. If they were trying to do, you thought they would get it by accident, even if they were, if they were trying to hit north and south, but they they weren't. So what were they looking at? This was my sample of um, sites. I tried to get as many across the UK as I could. Um, and this was the distribution pattern of the entrances. So we're looking at someone standing in the center of the henge, looking through the entrances. Now they have a bank, as I said, a bank and a ditch. So you have this, sort of entrance in the bank through which stars or heavenly bodies could be seen rising or setting. 
and so this is this was a pattern completely different from what I'd expected. I had expected everything to be aligned on the sun and the moon, but hardly anything was. It was all this area between the two. It was aligned on something else. There were these exceptions, which I will mention later. Um, this is actually towards the rising of the sun on May Day in the constellation of Orion. But again, I don't want to get I want to get ahead of myself. So it's to the north and south, but it's not directly north and south. They they don't want to. It's not like the Great Pyramid where they want to say we we have aligned this to magnetic north or astronomic north. They're aligned to something that has variation. So what I did was to sit down with an astronomy program. This one is called Stellarium. And it is, it's free. It's on the internet and it's free. And it's probably the best archaeoastronomy um, program that you can get. Um, it's written by archaeoastronomers. Um, you can use it to look at how the sky is today. Um, but then you can choose any date in history um, and see what the stars were doing. So obviously first thing you'll do is look at your birthday or, or what have you but then after that you can then go back to 3000 BC and see what the stars were doing at Stonehenge and what was happening through that south southwest entrance at Stonehenge in 3100 BC which then wasn't happening 300 years later so they cut it off and what it was was the setting of crux this is a southern cross now it doesn't look much here but the southern cross is one of the most astonishing sights in the night sky except we can't see it in the northern hemisphere anymore due to this precession that that slight shift in uh, the heavens that i was talking about now it will return in time probably in about like, twenty thousand years you know want to stick around and see it um or go to the southern hemisphere where it's such a amazing constellation that you know it's on the new zealand flag and um what also makes it stand out is that it was is slap bang in the middle of the milky way so crux at this time 3100 bc was it wasn't I mean, this is south here. It wasn't that far. It never rose that far above the horizon. But it was setting here. And this seems to be what that entrance was concentrated on. Um, so there's the 3100 BC setting. A thousand years later, it had moved a good, well, almost 20 degrees to the south and by the time we get to the middle of the bronze age you couldn't see it anymore from britain so it had disappeared so even at this stage when stonehenge was built it was starting to decline and it was moving to the south so could this be why they then blocked that entrance because it was no longer aligned and instead it was visible through the southern entrance and they built that corridor of posts 2600 BC so this is 500 years later they they're directing their gaze at this same star um uh, am i just randomly choosing this this constellation well no it's it's one of the brightest and most amazing views in the in the sky and if you sit there with this computer program like i have for hours and hours going through to see what is rising and setting at a certain point, you see which certain stars jump out at you. And there's nothing else really rising or setting in this location at this time than crux. So this is it. Now we call it the Southern Cross, but that is a, a modern 
take on the on the shape if i was to give you a pencil and ask you to join the dots you wouldn't necessarily make a cross you would perhaps more likely make a kite or a diamond shape a lozenge <laughs> Now, as compared to the midwinter alignments, which was 25%, 60% of the sites I looked at had an entrance aligning on either the rising or setting of crugs. So automatically, this is three times as likely um, an explanation for the sites than the solstices. But of course, this is just one way. The, the, as I say, the entrances um, tend to be on opposite sides. What is in the north of the sky? If you carry that line through, if you're not just looking out the center, what happens if you turn to the north out of the entrance? What do you see there? Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is one of the most striking constellations in the northern sky because of the, the, the W, it's very easy to see. It's one of the few that people can pick out. And it's also in the Milky Way. You wouldn't know it, actually, if you live in England. <laughs> you have to go somewhere without any light pollution to really see the Milky Way. I think this is one of the reasons why archaeologists have ignored it for so long, because they don't realise the, <coughs> the, the, the view the effect the view of the Milky Way has when it's seen in a unpolluted sky. I mean, it's just mind blowing to see, to see it and to see when you're in a, in a place with so little light pollution that you can see the dust clouds in front of the Milky Way. It, I saw that in Yosemite in the 90s and it just blew me away. Um, and a lot of ancient cultures, especially the South American cultures, um, have a lot of myths tied in with the, with the dust clouds, with the shape of the dust clouds in the Milky Way. Anyway, the Milky Way, um, Cassiopeia is in the Milky Way. But there is a, another kind of... Um, piece to the to the pattern this is milky the milky uh, this is Cassiopeia skimming the horizon um from the henge at marden uh, you have all these kind of um neat tricks seen from the site but the important thing is Cassiopeia has the same kind of percentage of alignments as as crux but it's on the complete opposite side of the sky and there's a kind of seesaw mechanism between the two as crux rises cassiopeia sets or, or skims the horizon and as cassiopeia rises crux sets and in some places in some of these changes we're talking at the same time we're talking you know or within minutes so you can imagine a ritual going on where they they see crux rising and at the same time the whole of the sky is joined by this band and if you turn around you'll see cassiopeia setting so what are the chances that these two amazing constellations both at opposite sides of the milky way should be highlighted by the entrances and exits of this henge at the same time now, the henges also, in most cases, had white banks. And if they didn't have white material, a lot of these were built in chalk downland, but places or up in Yorkshire at Thornborough, where they were covered in gypsum, in places where there wasn't white material, they had white material brought in and placed like quartz placed over the, the henge banks. So what we have is the entrances mirroring the position of the Milky Way at a certain point, at the rising of crux or the setting of crux. And so you can imagine the Milky Way joining the 
two sides of the hinge, like sort of the handles of a basket. So linking the the earth below to the to the heavens above. And then at a certain point, the especially in the Neolithic period, the Milky Way actually tilted on its side and ringed the whole horizon. We don't get that this day because of procession. We only get one. It's a bit sort of ass about face. We just get one bit sticking up. But in the Neolithic period, the whole thing set on the horizon. So you can see the Milky Way ringing the whole of the Earth. And I wonder whether the white circle of the hinges are supposed to sort of mirror this. It's like heaven, heaven coming down to Earth and meeting some kind of divine cosmogony, some sort of coming together of earth and sky. And here's some more examples um, of the orientation of, of hinges with the Milky Way. Another coincidence that that we find the actual image i've got on the computer you've got the, the span you can ditch of stonehenge around here with the entrances here and here so the milky way in the sky also mirrors the position of local rivers in this case the avon so there's a connection between the river in the sky and the river down on earth um, in places where the, the river is running sort of in this direction, then the hinge tends to be aligned on the rising of Crux and the setting of Cassiopeia. But in this case, it's um, on the setting of Crux and the rising of Cassiopeia. The position of local rivers dictates um, which aspect of the, of the Milky Way is, is focused on. And again, it's that question of, uh, as above so below you know what is going on in the heavens is reflected on earth so then having identified these these two constellations crux and cassiopeia i then um and, and that seesawing connection between them i asked whether there was a a symbolic reason why these stars might have been chosen which took me into art um these are um inscribed stones at four knocks in county meath in ireland um here the chamber of this passage tomb we call them tombs because we don't really know what else to call them they had they have bodies in them but then again, churches have bodies in them, but they're not tombs. Um, the, the passage of this tomb aligns on the rising of Cassiopeia and the setting of Crux. And certain inscribed stones pointing towards these parts of the Milky Way are also inscribed in a fashion indicative of the constellations within the Milky Way, according to my analysis anyway. People may disagree. This is a burial chamber at Barclodio de Gaures on Anglesey. It means the, the apron full of the giantess. Um, and in the, the, the passage of the tomb, which is aligned to the setting of Cassiopeia, um, in the southwest passage over here, is this um, uh, stone which has been carved into the, the shape of a, it's roughly anthropomorphic. But we see at the center of it, two of these lozenges and then the W's of Cassiopeia above that. Um, so it's as if the, this figure is representing that that Milky Way. Now, the W, you know, it's, it's representative of the shape of breasts of a, of a female figure. Now, in 
Welsh tradition, the, the Cassiopeia is called Llys Don, which means the court of Don or Danu. Danu is a, is a Celtic goddess, and Danu comes from the Indo-European word meaning she who gives milk. So you could see that there's a breast connection there. Um, whether the, the diamond, the lozenge shape at the bottom is a female symbol um, is a question I then looked into. Um, these are other female symbols from other Welsh um, tombs. But you find similar patterning. Uh, these are from Iberia. These are goddess figures buried with Neolithic um, people in, um, in graves in, in Spain and Portugal. And we can actually trace these symbols and associate them, associate them with female figures um, in Neolithic art, spreading all the way from um, down at Chattel Hoyuk, going all the way to in about 7,000 BC, all the way up to Britain in about 3,500 BC. But in a lot of early farming cultures, especially from the Balkans, we find these female figurines and they have the, uh, the lozenge associated normally on the belly um, and a lot of times with four dots. Sometimes they've been impressed with seeds as if to, to highlight the fact that this is, a, this is productive, this is to do with fertility. And then we see another, you see figures with the M or sort of the, this shape associated with the breasts. So my reasoning is that if we look at the figure, uh, the, these, are, these are some more of them. Um, some of these, uh, um, as I say, from the, uh, what Maria Gimbutas calls Old Europe, sort of 6,500 BC, Cucutani, um, Trapilia culture. Um, this is um, the lozenge from Wessex, Bronze Age Wessex. These are the Fulton drums found in a grave in Yorkshire, which have the lozenge pan and then the sort of breast image on top. So it's, it, this is a universal symbol throughout the Neolithic of, of the goddess, of the, of the female image with the um, a symbol of reproduction. It's the, the womb of the goddess. And you don't have to go far to find other Neolithic cultures that anthropomorphize the Milky Way and see it as a, a female image, the uh, Egyptian tradition. Um, does this with the, the goddess of the night sky, Nut. Now, Nut, there is some argument over it, but most people would agree that the curving image of Nut um, across the sky is the Milky Way. Now, Nut is responsible for the death and rebirth of the sun. She swallows the, the sun each evening, and instead of the sun go, the sun doesn't go, according to Egyptian tradition, doesn't go under the earth through the night to appear in the east. It doesn't set in the west and go under the earth. It goes back into the sky through the body of the goddess and then is reborn in the east from her womb. So it travels through the Milky Way at night, but we don't see it because it's inside her. Now she's also associated with a cow, with a white cow. Um, so this image is also associated with Hathor, goddess Hathor who gives birth to the sun um, in, in the form of her, her son Horus. And here we can see the, the sky as the cow with the stars along its belly. So the sun will, be, will enter and then be born again the next morning. And we can see the same image from, this is from um, uh, Temple at Dendera, Temple of Hathor at Dendera. And she's also associated with um, death and rebirth. 
So just as she's a fertility figure associated with the fertility in life, in death, the, uh, the soul of the, um, uh, of the deceased will go into the starry other world <laughs> called the Duat through the body of the goddess and be reborn as a star. Um, and so we find Nut, goddess Nut, depicted on coffin lids there on the left. So you can see the, the sun being eaten by her and then being born from her. And there we see her as the Milky Way stretched over the earth god, Geb. So this foreshortened image of the Milky Way gives you an idea of, of the, the link between, between Nut and, and the heavens. And it might seem a, a long shot associating this, um, uh, this mythology um, with Northern European cultures, such as the Hendes, but um, I think we see a similar thing here in Bronze Age Denmark. Now, this is the burial of the egg-fed girl. She was a girl who died probably about 15, 16 years old. And she was buried in this strange corded skirt, which wouldn't have left anything to the imagination if she was cavorting around. And we think that's what she was doing because it, we see the same skirt on bronze figurines doing somersaults. And we think it was a kind of spring or fertility dance. And I think what she's doing is she's acting out the, the curve of the Milky Way, the same that um, Nut did in Egypt. And just as Nut has the sun on her in her belly, so the egg fed girl was buried with a solar disk over her over her womb so i think the same sort of thing is going on in northern europe i think there's a, a shared neolithic tradition i can imagine that this girl is dancing in the spring aping the um uh, the dance of the milky way in the heavens and the re rebirth of the sun um and this goddess of the milky way and of cows is also associated with with tombs um here's a cow goddess mehet Weret, depicted at thebes guarding um a tomb on the on the west bank and exactly the same thing occurs in neolithic tombs in um uh, in europe where we see a lot of female figurines female imagery and um, Bucrania, the cow imagery. Now, the, the most obvious connection between the cow and the Milky Way um, mm. that mirrors those we find in Egypt is an Irish goddess called, called Boan or Boyne. Now she lives at, well, she dwells at Newgrange, which is a great Neolithic passage grave, um, dates to about 3000 BC on the River Boyne. And in the myth, she, she is responsible for the foundation of the River Boyne. Her name means, comes from Bofinia, which means white cow. So she is the white cow and she creates the River Boyne. But she also is responsible for the creation of the Milky Way. Now, Newgrange, the, the passage grave where, where she lives, um, the Irish name for it is Bruna Boigne, which means the womb of the white cow. So that if you're buried in there, then you have gone back to the mother in order to be reborn. Um, the, the facade of the tomb is white quartz, okay? and it's very much, if you see it from above, it mirrors that curve of the Milky Way. The central passage of the tomb aligns on midwinter sunrise. 
Now you can go in there and get and see this at midwinter, but it's a bit of a lottery. I think you need to get a ticket. I think the wait's about 20 years <laughs> and it's bound to be raining the day that you go. But they, they have set up a light system where they recreate it. So if you go there and do a tour, you can actually see the sun creep up the passage and it's as if the, the sort of phallic ray of the sun creeps up the passage and hits hits the, the crucible passage at the back. So this is midwinter morning and it's like the rebirth of the sun. So you can see, yeah, this is this is it shining through um, an aperture above the door. So it's the same sort of image as this, the cow goddess of the Milky Way in Egyptian myth. Now, she's not only responsible for the production of the river, the River Boyne, which is named after her, which means the river of the white cow. The Milky Way is called the path of the white cow, Bohab Nabofim. So here in Ireland, as in Egypt, the Milky Way is associated with the white cow. And if we go back to the start of the lecture with the with the girl Blornat who is stolen along with the three cows and the cauldron and who pours milk into the river as a signal. We're seeing that this is this is part of an ancient symbology, which is um, being recorded in these myths. But the. Um, the alignment that we saw at Newgrange with the midwinter sun, with the midwinter sunrise. Um, as I've come to discover through watching um, a lot of the lectures here, um, it, it is a later revamping of the myth. I will talk about this myth first and then we'll see what was behind it. So in essence, you, you might ask, what has the Milky Way and Crux to do with the rebirth of the sun at midwinter? And the, the best example I can find to, to explain it is the Japanese myth of Amaterasu, the sun goddess who hides away at the winter solstice in a cave. And this causes the world to go into kind of, it's, remember in Greek myth, when Persephone is abducted into the underworld, the, the world withers. This is winter, the fertility is taken away from the landscape and everything is dying. And the gods are worried, the rest of the gods are worried. They're thinking, how can we get the sun to come out of the cave? Um, she's sort of gone in there in a fit of peak um, it, it, uh, and refuses to come out. And the way they decide to get her to come out is that a, a, a divine figure called Ameno Azumi decides to do a lewd dance outside of the cave. So she's dancing around and she's she's revealing herself. She's lifting her skirts and revealing herself. And all the gods are laughing. And Amaterasu, hidden in her cave, thinks, what the hell are they laughing at? And so she pops her head out to see what's going on. And at that moment, they grab her and then they close the door behind her so they can't, so she can't get back in. And it's, it's such a strange myth. I mean, what, what does it mean? Why, what is this display of this woman, um, this erotic display that causes the sun to, to escape from the underworld? Well, Azume, her name means whirling heavenly woman. And for this, this dance, she is rewarded for saving the, the universe, really, saving the world by allowing the sun to escape. She was rewarded by being given the Milky Way. And I think really she is the Milky Way to begin with. This is the heavenly whirling woman that we that her name means. And it the, the Milky Way even sort of bifurcates at one point like a pair of legs. It is like a female form moving in the heavens. So what about 
her lifting her skirts well we've looked at the the imagery of crux as the lozenge when you go back to the advent of farming in about 7000 bc as seen from the near east <coughs> The um, stars of Crux rose at exactly the same point as the midwinter sun. So it's almost as if if you were looking to see when the when the year would turn, when the sun would be reborn, you would look, and then you would you would see on the southern horizon the rising of Crux at the point where the sun would then be reborn the dancing of the heavenly woman revealing herself presages the rebirth of the sun i think that's where this myth comes from and we can date it back to by this to about 7000 bc in the um fertile crescent Another thing that allows us to date it is the appearance of the rescuer in the myth. The man, the, the figure who rescues the sun after the woman dances um, in a lot of Indo-European myths, a hero like Cahulim in, in the first instance um, defeats the monster who is protecting the sun. The, sort of, he, the monster represents winter dark clutches of winter and the underworld and the hero goes into the underworld and and rescues the sun from this monster now the monster in a lot of indo-european traditions has three heads um and um this is from a drinking horn from gallehus in in denmark dates to about the third century AD. but here's the hero the hero um Coming to slay the monster. And we notice he's got a bow and arrow, and there are three stars above him. Now, looking through uh, the astronomy programs that I was using to reconstruct the ancient sky, we find that in this early period, in about 7000 BC, onwards to about 3500 BC, the midwinter sun is preceded out of the underworld by the constellation of Orion. So Orion is this figure striding across the sky who is rescuing and pulling the, um, the sun out um, of the underworld. In the earliest myths, um, because of precession, he's carrying the sun on his shoulder. Now, this is something we find in Greek myth, in the myth of Orion. And we also, it also carries on into Christian tradition in the figure of St. Christopher, who is crossing a river and he's got the Christ child on his shoulder and the Christ child grows heavy. And, you know, the solar image, it's Orion carrying the sun. I haven't got time to go into this too much. It's in my thesis, but it's in a lot of traditions. But well, we can date this um, uh, this tradition back to the Near East um, at the same time as Crux is rising at the winter solstice. So um, Orion is acting as the as the sun rescuer. Um, and just to say, show that things never get old, um, because we have a tradition where the 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 female is rescued from the underworld by the figure walking through the sky the skywalker rescued by from her <laughs> dark father as we will see is sometimes kin her father that's keeping her imprisoned uh, that's what darth vader means and um, darth dark father it's it's an old myth but it still has um, it forms the basis of most hero myths today the rescue of the maiden by the hero and it's we put such a nice spin on it um 
until we realize what it replaced. <laughs> um, there's a, another Irish version which, um, in which the god, the Dagda, which means the good god, means he's good at everything. Um, he rescues his, this female um, figure from her father's camp um, her, her father, who is associated with a, a, a blazing eyed demon called Balor, um, very sort of lunar characteristics. Um, anyway, the, the, the myth says how the Dagda carries this woman that he rescues on his back and he puts three stones in his belt. I mean, I've not seen any explanation of what these three stones might be. Um, and it has been said that they were his testicles which fell from it um, as these these, um, these stones fall. Um, and he becomes lovers with the, with the woman. But it seems to me quite obvious that, we again, we're looking at the rescue of the son by Orion. And there we have the three stones in his belt. And... Um, it has been said they were his testicles which fell from it. The, I, I think the connection between Orion and these mythical figures is, is quite clear, especially in some of the Celtic myths. And looking at the orientation of the henges, I found that 38% of the, the sites had some kind of orientation to the constellation of Orion. Um, the best one um, was at Yavering in Northumbria. Now, the Henge was built in the shadow of the hill. Oh, it's a massive hill. There's a great Anglo-Saxon site on top of Yavering. But, but the Henge is built to the north of it. And it was so built that if you were to sit in the Henge on a winter's night, you could watch Orion walking across the hill, like literally walking with his dog Sirius following him, like the grand old Duke of York, walking up to the top of the hill and down again. So this is, this was what passed for entertainment back in the Neolithic. <laughs> before, before television, this was, your, this was your Star Wars, watching Orion rescuing the sun. So that's as far as I'd got with my PhD. I'd finished the PhD and I'd come to the conclusion that the henges were aligned with the rising or the setting of Crux and Cassiopeia, um, linked with the womb of the goddess um, in the dark nights preceding the solstice, um, when the sun maiden was rescued from the forces of winter by the hero Orion after the sign of the Milky Way appeared in the sky. So this is the first myth we talked about, the woman who's trapped within the henge, releases the milk into the water. The, the Milky Way appears in the sky, as it does in the Japanese myth. And this allows the rescue of the Sun Maiden. And I was kind of happy with that because I spent 30 plus years. And then I, then I was asked to write a um, chapter in Lionel's um, Lionel's book, and I wrote about how the solar cults had overtaken lunar cults, and then I was like, oh, "God, there's a whole new level to this that I've not looked at." And so that that was um, that was what I turned to next. So the question I then asked was, was the original myth of the appearance of the Milky Way not a yearly event linked with, uh, linked with the rebirth of the moon with the sun but, uh, at midwinter, but a monthly event linked with the dark moon? This is something that Lionel Simmons talked about, the dark moon, how the winter solstice um was a was an event where the the new solar cult had hijacked the old dark moon cult and turned it into a yearly yearly event rather than a monthly event um uh, taking away the power of the moon 
uh, and the sort of equality of the, of the feminine. So yeah, this was the, this was the next question, and so I was I was quite surprised to find that there there was a, a fairly similar Milky Way myth to the first one I mentioned um, amongst the Bushmen in Africa. And there's a Khoisan myth that talks about the creation of the Milky Way by a girl and um, she's undergoing um, her first menstruation and she has been isolated in the women's camp and she's been given roots to eat and she's a bit bored of the limited diet and probably the lack of company. And it said that she threw the ashes from a fire into the air um, to create the dust clouds of the Milky Way and then threw the um, roots of the of the plant that she'd been given to eat into the fire which which formed the stars of the Milky Way. Um, so in, she does this in a kind of fit of anger and frustration really at, at I suppose her isolation and her limited diet um, but the way the tale has been interpreted or the different versions of it suggest that um, there's there are more connections to it than to the Celtic than you would think. Um, Michael Wessels had written a piece on this in Folklore um, on the story of the girl of the early race who made stars and I'll just quote a bit of this. Um, this is the creation. The girl arose, she put her hands into the wood ashes, she threw out the wood ashes into the sky, she said to the wood ashes, the wood ashes which are here, they shall alt altogether become the Milky Way. The girl was the one who said that the Milky Way must glow for the people, that the people might return home by night, in the middle of the night, for the earth would not have glowed had the Milky Way not been there, that and the stars. So, although she does this out of a fit of anger, there's a sense that she's doing it uh, there, there, there is a, a kind of beneficial reason for the rest of the tribe. And this is so that people may return home at night. It's a sign. It's a signal. It's a way marker. And Wessels goes on. Two major versions of the story of the girl of the early race occur in the collection. Two accounts together generate a sig significantly wider range of meanings than a single version would. In one version... Um, the girl's actions follow directly from anger at her mother and then by extension the social order. As Belinda Yerson emphasizes, it's the ritual restrictions on her movements and diet at the time of Menarche that enforced by her mother and other closely related older women, which elicits the girl's ire and leads her to throw ashes and roots into the sky. Um, in the longer version, her actions are driven not only by anger, but by a calculated intent that contains benevolent elements. The girl makes the stars by throwing roots into the sky. Her motives are presented as humane. She wishes to provide light for people at night, specifically for the young men out hunting. At first reading, the anger she displays towards her mother and the other women appears as an adjunct to the central narrative. One possible explanation, but not one the story wishes to offer directly, is that her lighting up the night defiantly links her with a social group from whom she is richly most excluded, the young men. It is their nocturnal hunting excursions that especially require this light. Whatever its precise motivation and however beneficial its results, it is the rebellious nature of her act that leads to the narrator's condemnation of her. So looking at the two examples, the Irish and the African, we find that there's similarities but differences. The African version, it's dark moon, whereas in the Celtic version, it's the dark of the year. It has a, a different emphasis. It's been widened onto a solar, solar framework. In the African version, the, the moon, as with all women menstruating, the moon is her husband. As if you hear, if you listen to any of Jerome's talk, she will. Um, pick up on this. Um, just as in the Irish version, the figure of Kuroi 
who I mentioned at the beginning, had so many lunar aspects that it seems that she was captured or was was courting a supernatural heavenly figure. So Kuroi is a lunar, a lunar figure. In both cases, the men are away um, hunting, but in the African version, um, the woman remains chaste. Um, whereas in the Irish, she decides to take a lover and betray her husband, the moon. Um, there's there's a hint of this in the African version where she's she is rebellious. And in one version, she is, I think, killed by by her husband after this event. Um, but are they are they related? I came up with a a question whether there was an original schema whereby at dark moon the maiden at her first menstruation goes into the women's house the place of her kin and she moves away from her non-kin men folk and potential husbands and becomes the wife of the moon um, now her segregation ensures the hunting prowess of the men this is why it's important that she is she is kept separate so that this is not diluted. Um, she then makes the Milky Way as a signal, a way marker for the men from the food that she's being given. And this eventually allows the men re to return safely. And I wonder whether there's something cyclical about this. She goes into the menstrual hut. Um, she is with the moon. She creates the Milky Way. The moon leaves. The men come back. This is a monthly um, ongoing cycle. So there's a, that division, the, the moving from the light to the dark. It's never resolved. It's always, there's always that um, equality and cyclical nature. Um, now, the Celtic tales don't have that. I, I say that with a caveat that there is one, I say Celtic, an English tale that does preserve some of this, and that's the story of Gwen and the Green Knight. And what I, I don't want to go too much in this because I could talk for hours and I probably want to keep this for another time. But uh, in the tale of Gwen and the Green Knight, the Green Knight arrives at Camelot, Gwen chops his head off and he lifts his head back onto his body and demands that Gawain come back to the chapel green in a year and a day's time to receive a return return strike so the green knight is a is a supernatural figure um uh, the beheading and the rebirth is very much a lunar characteristic um Gawain goes um uh, to the castle of um, a lord called Lord Bertilac, and he is seduced by Lord Bertilac's wife while Bertilac is out hunting. But he stays, he stays chaste. He does not give in to her advances. Now there is a bit of flirting between them, and the, the, the Bertilac is out hunting during the day, and. Each time when he comes home, that the things he has hunted are getting more and more poultry. Starts off with a boar uh, and then a deer. And at the end, it's just a manky old fox skin. It's as if the, the hunting element, his luck at hunting is decreasing as Gawain and the wife are getting more intimate. So there's a connection there. But, uh, but Gawain stays chased. He doesn't sleep with her. And as a result, he is given a girdle by her, which allows him to survive the beheading test when the Green Knight will then try and behead him just as Gawain beheaded him to begin with. I mean, I butchered that tale and I'm sorry, but it, but maybe I'll come and give a give a talk about it in the future. Um, but in this story, the, the conclusions I came to were this. The Green Knight, if one continues to look behind the usual view of him as a seasonal vegetable figure, and instead at his lunar origins becomes, as the husband of the sequestered lady, the moon. He is also associated with hunting, 
kind of guardian of the wild. His beheading and rebirth make sense in such light. He can survive death as he's lunar, constantly waxing and waning. The moon is a severed head in many worldwide cultures. It is Yule, um, originally dark moon, and we have the confined woman chaperoned by an old woman whose husband is out hunting. This corresponds to women isolating during menstruation. As Gwen and the lady grow closer, Bertilak's hunting luck grows weaker. In short, it suggests um, messing about with the women will affect your hunting prowess. That's Aquila, is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, keep chase at dark moon and you'll survive, is the, is the implication, especially if the Green Knight husband is somehow connected to the spirit of the forest and the hunt. Although not betraying the Green Knight, Gawain nevertheless receives a wound on the neck and returns to society. Um, this is menstrual imagery, bearing the hallmarks of some kind of male initiation, aping the bleeding of the females. In this tale, Gawain survives the ordeal because of his chastity and the woman's magic, the girdle. He respects her menstruation and bleeds along with her, not diluting its power. So that's the Celtic version where we have the old the old version kept intact. But other Celtic versions, like the Irish one I started off with, um, have a different outcome. One of the most obvious is the Welsh tale of Kiloch and Olwen. Um, Olwen is the daughter of a, of a one-eyed giant called Uspadadan, which means giant hawthorn. Um, and she has been told that if if she marries, her husband, her father will be killed. So it's in the interests of her father to keep her um, a virgin. Um, but the hero, Kiluk, whose name means pig run, or, um, he goes and asks Uspathadon whether um, he can have the daughter and Uspathan says well I will send you set you a, a number of challenges and if you can complete these challenges then you're worthy of her and these mostly to do with farming and hunting actually um, he has to hunt a magical boar called Tuch Truith and he is aided on the quest by the woman and the woman Olwen her name means white track it's because um, a track of white flowers springs up wherever she walks this is clearly uh, the same image as the, the River of Milk. It's the Milky Way. So the Milky Way daughter, um, the signal of the Milky Way, um, presages the, the, the release of the of fertility. Um, here we see Uspathadon um, as, a, as a kind of ogre. And he's, he's, a, he's a massive figure, but it's said that when when Kilov walks into the the castle to see him, he asks his men to lift his eyes up with a with his his eye up with a fork, with a wooden like pitchfork, um, because his eye his lids are so heavy. The the idea that he's gone there at dark moon and he is seeing the opening of the eye of the of this lunar figure is is hard to escape. Anyway, um, he does hunt. Kiluk is able to kill the, the magical boar, and using the tusks of the boar, he shaves Uspathadon and cuts his head off and wins the daughter. In this version, the lunar figure is defeated and the daughter is won for the hero. The, the lunar figure is... Um, is a demon is a he's a monster to be defeated there's no sharing it's not go go with the moon for a few days come back to your husband that equality and that that um cyclical nature is ended so that original lunar version which i mentioned before has been turned into a solar one this farming seasonal variant so instead of it being dark moon it's now winter it's a dark of the year um, the maiden is abducted by a demonic figure or is already 
imprisoned by her father, as in the Welsh tale Uspadan, um, who is her kin. So this is the equivalent of her being in the menstrual heart with her kin. Um, but this is now seen as a negative thing from which she needs rescuing. So she's kept away from non-kin menfolk and potential husbands, but this is seen as bad. Um, she makes the Milky Way as a signal way marker. A white track springs up where she treads. This allows her suitor to find her. She aids, aids her potential suitor in hunting and her husband, captor father, is beheaded. So we see an end of the old lunar cults. So now it's husband to demon to husband, um, as we saw before, where it was husband to moon to husband to moon. But now it's a once yearly event. It's a rescuing of the sun at winter. And it's the 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 whole lunar side is seen as, as negative. The lunar myth has been solarized and the moon has been demonized. Mm. We're nearly there. <laughs> you need to stop soon. <coughs> yeah, okay, right. I've got about three more slides, I think. So, um, Henge is another monument to align with the Milky Way, most notably the rising setting points of Cassiopeia and Crux, and related to a myth where the Sun Maiden is rescued at mid midwinter from the clutches of the demons in the underworld by a hero, Orion, who has been given a tip off on the right hand to rescue her, the sun, the cows, the cauldron, by her creating the Milky Way as a sign. The demon's daughter motif is prevalent in Indo-European myth and her betrayal of her kin allows the hero to win her and the prize from the demons for good. But arguably, given the lunar cults behind the later solar ones, as Sims and others have argued, this may have originally stemmed from a lunar myth where the monthly appearance of the Milky Way signaled dark moon. In the original myth, the rebellious Khoisan girl who fed up with her poor diet and seclusion amongst the menstruating women burns the roots to create the Milky Way, which arguably acts as a guide illuminating the dark skies for the hunters. With the advent of farming and the move to more northerly latitudes, society changed, becoming more seasonal, interest in the solar year due to its relevance to the farming cycle. Likewise, the status of women changed with the advent of cattle ownership and bride price. The original myth was rehashed and reused to subvert the power of women and the lunar cults. The original cycle back and forth of the women between husband and moon family at menstruation ended. The once slightly rebellious woman now betrays her kin who is Caesar's booty and her lunar father husband is beheaded for good or at least for that solar year. This motif becomes integral to Indo-European dominated society as the cattle theft and they use it to justify taking other people's property, land, women and cows. Bruce Lincoln calls it the imperialist myth par excellence. Um, here's a, just a, a, a um, table showing the change. I'm going to skip past that. Um, in my thesis, I, I was arguing that the Milky Way was a kind of road of souls. Yeah, to enter a henge was to enter the body of the mother, perhaps for rebirth, um, but I'm going to skip that because, however, in light of the original dark moon importance of the Milky Way, the female symbolism of a flowing Milky Way containing a heavenly womb, crux and breasts, Cassiopeia, there is another avenue to explore, the henge as originating in a sacred space for monthly observances. Although subverted in time to become associated with the solar cycle, as Sim suggested, an original lunar feminine mythology lies hidden behind the new rites. Perhaps original use of henges and other ritual structures was as a woman's house, a place of power where a lone girl seated at night in the circle threw roots into a fire or poured milk into a stream. A rite later altered to become more solar oriented after the defeat of the moon and the rescue of the woman from her kin. And what this makes us do is to look at the henge with its internal internal ditch and ex external bank and ask what the power is in there that people outside want protecting from. Is this to do with some sort of female power or even fear of that female power? And we're done.
Wow. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, John. That's like covered. You've gone all over Europe and to Egypt and to Southern Africa um, with an extraordinary thesis and transforming your own PhD thesis to see if it could pick up all of our stuff as well. Um, quite yeah, so you've, you've given me about another 10 years of extra work now. So I think, thank you. Yeah, that, that might be right. That might be right. Um, there's an enormous amount of, of food for thought in that. Yeah. Um, do you, does somebody, is somebody in the room able to facilitate questions there? And can you tell the Zoom people whatever the questions are there? And then we'll see. Actually, can you stop share screen so I can see? Yeah. Um, come out of share screen and we can see the, that's good. I don't know if there's anyone in the room wants question. Um, oh, but Bernie on Zoom, but is there somebody in the room first? No, I think go to Zoom first and then people will... Uh, Great. But Bernie, I think you've got lots to say. <laughs> well, thank you, I, John. That was absolutely brilliant. And I say that from an American's perspective, that it's like really <laughs> brilliant. Okay. Um, you're, you, may, you said a few things that I thought you were right on. One of them is that the, the terrestrial realm of the Hampshire Avon is um, represented within Stonehenge. And that's a that's a much older tradition. It goes back to the Upper Paleolithic. I'll send you a, a email on that. So if you don't get my email, um, tag me through somehow. Find me um, if it gets bounced on your hot mail. So that is a very old tradition. Um, and the second thing is that it might be possible that the hinge or the let's call it the ditch, right? I mean, from American perspective, uh, if the ditch had water in it it would possibly reflect the stars that would then have a connection to your Milky Way on the horizon. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There was, um, especially places like Avebury where the water table is quite high, the question of whether the, uh, the Henge ditch was filled with water is, is a kind of moot point amongst archaeologists and I see no reason why it shouldn't have been or whether they could have clay lined the ditches to keep the water in there there's there's at least one henge at Marden where a river literally runs through the through the henge itself um, and there it would have been easy to divert the water through the through the henge um, and to have seen yeah to used it for for observations or to, to see the stars in the water yeah, I'm totally up for that. That's that's a good idea. If there was clay lining, you'd find it archaeologically, I'm mm. sure. Yeah. But you don't even need the clay. You don't need the clay because you don't need to have it full. You just need to have some water in it. Yeah. So many of these places are on chalk in the UK. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> that drain slide. Thank you. John, John yeah. Cox, go for it. You need to unmute, can't hear. One thing that I've been thinking is, um, I mean, just as stars rise and set, so also portions of the Milky Way rise and set. Mm. Um, so, uh, have you thought about the bit of Milky Way you're looking at and whether it's rising or whether it's setting or whether it's, as it were, dipping into the underworld? I mean, um... <laughs> yeah, so I was um, looking at the um, crux as, as rising and setting and then Cassiopeia as definitely, definitely setting. But the weird thing is that the, the further north you go, the, the less sites like Cassiopeia to the north actually set. When you get to Orkney, you can't see Crux at all, but you can see Cassiopeia, and Cassiopeia there grazes the horizon. And that's where we think the Henge building tradition started. And I do wonder whether there was an awareness that 
the fact that it, from the southern of Britain, you can see stars in the south, which you can't see in the north, and also stars which are setting at Stonehenge don't set in Orkney. It, what what kind of effect that had on your concept of the universe? Do you then have an idea that you're living on a globe? Mm. How else do you oh. explain? So I, I, I think there are other implications as well about sort of getting to uh, mm. <laughs> making science, you know, scientific observation. Okay, the, the, the aspect I was thinking of is, is if the Milky Way is rising, then it, it can, as it were, take souls up with it. Yeah. Whereas if the Milky Way is, as it were, setting, then it takes souls down with it to the extent that the Milky Way is seen as a ladder of souls, which may just be um, a North American idea, but... Uh... Yeah, yeah, that was the one that I originally, in my thesis, went with, that it was... Uh, that it was a a kind of Jacob's ladder, and it was it was a place. So a hinge was a place where where the the dead, perhaps you would, although there were there were very few burials um, associated with henges. Early on in Stonehenge, there were burials, but in in most cases, we don't know where the people of the late Neolithic or the early Bronze Age were buried. And we and the idea is perhaps that they were put in water. My my thought is that perhaps the, the henges were used for excarnation and that this was a place where the souls of the dead would rise to the Milky Way. And then after the bones had been stripped, they were then placed in a river, uh, an equivalent of uh, sort of the earthly equivalent of the Milky Way. So I think, yeah, that that rising and setting aspect is something that I think is is really important in the use of the henges. Um, have you got anyone in the room with questions, Jerome? It seems to me there's a lot more about cows in this story that we like to admit, yep. and I don't know how much there is. I'm just wondering whether anyone's done any work on the neurotic tribes and their punch-ups with these huge cows with these incredible crescent-shaped horns, mm. even altering the way they grow, but not necessarily in a crescent. They bred them to be mm. that incredible shape. I just It just sort of came into my... No, I, that that was something that I was, I started to to look at um, the um, I'm trying to think of the name of the the Dinka tribe. Yeah, yeah. Dinka, Dinka, yeah. Dinka, yeah. yeah. That that is very, you know, you can almost see roots of some of the later um, uh, Egyptian traditions mm. in in those, and I think that yeah, the 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 cow is so central to those cultures i mean even going back um as as was mentioned a short a short while ago about to the paleolithic the stonehenge landscape was important because there was a a warm spring there and it was also on the migration trail of the aurochs and so we've got this cow connection going all the way back i think that um yeah, the, the centrality of the of, of the cow in these cultures is 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 massive, and the only way to really understand Bronze Age Britain is to look at it in the, the terms of those um, cattle breeding cultures. Um, it, the the problem is we tend to look back on on prehistory as if it was people like us, uh, especially when you look at reconstructions of how they think the Stonehenge and Avery landscape looked it just looks like us lot with dirty clothes <laughs> you know there's no there's I used to show, show my students pictures of um sort of crack utile ceremonies from northwest Canada and show them you know just the material culture and the and the and the sort of alienness of of everything and the textiles that just haven't survived you know we can't we can't look back and think that their relation to to cattle was the same as a medieval farmer. You know that it's that there's a there's a sacred level there that we that we just don't appreciate. Anne, do you want to chip in? 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, just wanted to um, mention the fact that Koo Colin, um, Koo is dog, you probably know this, but yeah. he was the hound, the hound of Colin. And also then Koo Ri is the hound of the plains. So I don't know whether <clears throat> you've thought a lot at all about the question of the, you know, the myth of the hound and the Irish wolfhound and these figures being hounds. Um, and then the second question I wanted to ask you was sometimes I kind of found it difficult to really understand the global connections. Um, and I just wanted to ask why you thought that there could be very similar myths going on at the same in the same historical period during the same period internationally, because presumably people wouldn't have been moving in the same way as obviously they would have many years later. That's yeah, the, the um, you're right about the the Kuhulin and Kuri Kuroi connection that the hound is um, the question is how much of that has been um, influenced by later Indo-European traditions where the 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 hound is seen as a, a as a kind of martial creature uh, and linked to um mana bunda sort of the the um men's groups warrior groups and there's there seems to be this always this um conflict between um Kahulin and and kuroi in in many stories in the in Brickreuse feast for instance, they're all, they're they're always matched against each other. Sometimes they're supporting each other, and it's and it's a test for for martial prowess. But yeah, the two seem to be as if uh, there, there's a, a hidden connection between the two. I think I think you're right in that. Um, the the far flung connections. My my original idea was to try and trace um, back Celtic motifs in the Indo-European languages. And to do that, I, I was looking at Colin Renfrew's thesis that the Indo-European languages had spread with farming from Anatolia from about 7000 BC, perhaps earlier. And although I didn't follow through with that, I didn't um, in the end, I, I kind of dismissed some of that. I was, I still found that there was cultural influences from Anatolia moving through um, the Mediterranean to Britain, and that I think that these these shared um, mythical images, especially surrounding the cow and the heavens, spread with that farming. So when you look at the if you analyze the bones of the cows which who that were found in neolithic britain these are anatolian cows so they've been that they, they have um, come all the way from the near east and i see no reason why a myth didn't accompany them as a, as part of the package the farming package included um a, a stella and, and um otherwise um myth so i think yeah it was part of the package so that's why i i feel that i can look at egypt and the near east and and all through the mediterranean because i'm following that pattern of farming and that's 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 my excuse um, Craig, we've just got time for just a few more maybe chris well, um, no i want to give way to denise i really want to hear what uh, denise okay said. denise but say something chris or i will but denise go on um thank you very much john for the talk it was fascinating um i work in the andes and um it's very different because you've got a herding society there that with animals that don't produce milk so yeah. the stories about the milky way are about urine and amniotic liquids and it's very much about stories of giving mm. birth to humans on the one hand and mm. giving birth to the baby animals in the december one which is the summer so we've got summer and winter back to front but um 
you know, there's a time of separation when the when the llamas up in the Milky Way, the dark cloud constellations go down to the horizon mm -hmm. in May, June. That's when the men go off to the valleys and they're separated from the women and the women, you know, get together and have different kinds of relationships and tell stories. But in December, it's when the, the little animals are born, the, the llamas are born. So there's not really a sun there and maybe it's just lost the sun since the Incas diminished and so on. Um, but there's very much as well the place for the souls of the dead. Yeah. The Milky Way. And also there are these like vegetation warrior spirits that are said to, to come down from the Milky Way during the rainy season. And then they go back to the Milky Way uh, at the end of the rainy season that day. Mm -hmm. of, um Tentacion, the temptation of Christ. Um, so there are many, many interesting things there. They, there is a, a kind of sense of white flowers and the white stars of the Milky Way, and the yeah. dark cloud constellations are redness and blood, women's blood. So mm. you have a kind of winter, summer, dark moon, light, um, full moon, and so on. But it, it's a very different way that people have come to think it through. Hmm. Yeah, comparatively speaking. Although, the, yeah, there are some weird connections between some of the South American myths. There's a, there's a lot of twin symbolism and beheading and, and all yes, this kind yes, of stuff. Lots that, of beheading. That, yeah, that we find in in some of the European ones as well. So that's I find that's intriguing. But yeah, and I do wish that you would look at at sites like Tiwanaku, you know, in the, in the Andes, because. The, the back wall of that is white, and, and there are lots of white stones there, and they come from a quarry up, lined on this wall up into the mountains. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the Milky Way plays a, plays a very big role there. Um, it, uh, have we got anyone in the room would like to question? Otherwise, I'll ask Chris to wrap up, unless there's anybody in the room. I think we're done. We're nearly. Chris, do you want to say a bit? Because I think we should say something about the well, <clears throat> the relationship of the hunting and the cattle cultures. Well, I, I, and I, I, I could say a little bit as well. I don't. I don't really feel equipped um, to to wrap up. I mean, it's such a stupendously ambitious talk, covering just about everything one could possibly think of in world mythology. So, um, but uh, to, I would just um, suggest before you go too far with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Could I ask you to make sure we have quite sort of extensive discussions among ourselves? Because Lyle himself, every 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 sort of Christmas, every, around Christmas, he used to give us um, a fantastic talk on Sir Gawain, and um, and I think his insights. I don't. I don't quite. I'm not sure he ever wrote anything anything down, and we didn't really record stuff. No, it's it. a tragedy. Real, he, real tragedy. But he um, had some brilliant stuff. I think, yeah. I think between us, those of us who heard Lionel will be able to piece together uh, a lot of it. And in any case, of course, Lionel's ideas came in part from, uh, you know, our own ideas about the, the moon and stuff. And, and I have some ideas of my own about um, about so going sort of complementing Lionel's stuff. So just um, <laughs> just we we need to sort of collaborate before we publish too much on that particular subject. Um, just an incredibly simple, obvious point, which obviously you must be aware of what you're clearly aware of. It's just that the, 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 the obvious point that the cow is the enemy of matrilineal. So the matrilineal belt uh, in Central Africa uh, is the area where, obviously, you know, you have you have Lebola, you have um, Bride Price. And what happens is that if where the tsetse fly flourishes, um, the people who've, the people who've, um, given away their daughter in exchange for a whole bunch of cattle. Um, the, okay, the cattle die because of the fly and they want their daughter back. And suddenly the, the, the superficially patrilineal system reverts to, to matriline. So wherever you've got those cows that you're already on the way, you know, yeah. on the, you're, you're on the way away from the moon and towards the sun and all that, and all that stuff. Um, I, 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 I don't want to take up any more time. Camilla, you, you say- uh, I just want to say a little bit about, um, African hunting ritual, the last time I was really under the Milky Way, 
Ooh. is the rituals of Epeme with the Hadza right on the equator in Tanzania. And there the dark moon ritual cycle really moves the whole community through um, singing at the dark moon, which has association to the girl's menstruation, etc., cetera, um, to uh, success for the hunt, which should occur at uh, as the moon brightens. Mm -hmm. So the, the Milky Way is strongly associated to that, to that dark moon. You cannot do Epeme unless the, there is no moon in the sky. You, uh, you see the Milky Way when there's that, that really dark moon. Um, the other thing to, to emphasize on the Ham story, um, the girl, the first girl uh, for the Southern African story, the first girl making the Milky Way. Um, of course, the emphasis for the Southern Africans, so the East African is, the Milky Way is about, is, is about blood. Um, or amniotic fluid, as, as da Denise Arnold's saying, of course, it's not about cows, even though there were pastoralist Khoisan people as well, but, mm. but as far as the, the hunting stories are concerned. So, so this solarization process is really substituting um, the blood and associations with the womb fluids and amniotic fluids, but, by overriding with with cattle, who of course imply bride sir, bride price, um, taking women right away from their kin, all of that going on, which doesn't apply to the hunting. Um, so this solarization process is, uh, uh, you you've really made me so excited by the idea of going to some of these sites and and trying to watch the sky as the <laughs> the entertainment, the night's entertainment, just just how much more entertainment than any kind of Netflix or Hulu that would be. <laughs> um, it, it, it is that process of capturing the, the magic, the original magic. And as you say, the defences are all pointing in, like defending outside from the huge power of what's yeah. inside yeah. the menstrual heart. That, that has such an emanating power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a fantastic way of uh, conceiving of it. Yeah, just fantastic. Um, we can only just say, um, you know, everybody I hope there is gonna um, give you a proper round of applause. Well, we can all give you a proper round of applause. Thank you so much, John. That was an absolute tour de force. Um, so yeah, we're gonna say <laughs> thank you and, and um, let you go. I hope you have a chance to go to the pub with um, Ian and the other guys if they're around. Um, but otherwise, have a have a good uh, journey home. Uh, I'll just mention um, for people there and people on the Zoom, and then we can shut down the Zoom. That next week's talk is with um, Professor Sean Sullivan, um, who is a long-term field worker with communities in Namibia um, on landscape and connection and memory of those communities in Namibia. And she's going to be showing one of her uh, recent films as a part of a community project called The Music Returns to Kayas. Uh, so we're going to be in the Namibian landscape next week. Um, but uh, so I hope, I hope that Chris and myself will be back there, but whatever. We should have Sean um, there and uh, and of course you're welcome on Zoom as well. So um, good night and, and good luck for everybody. And thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.